Hey, this is Mike Freilink. I'm the pastor at The Gathering, and I'd like to welcome you today as you listen to this week's message. I pray it encourages you, challenges you, and draws you closer to God and His purposes for your life. Uh, We've been in a series over the last few weeks titled, It Is Good News, Uh, taking a fresh look at the living Word of God and particular topics from His Word from the point of view that the Word of God is the ultimate authority and it reveals to us who our God is. How can we know who God is, what He's like, how He behaves, what He values? Well, it's the living Word of God that shows us The Word of God is living, it's divine, it's active, it's authoritative, it's complete, it's inerrant, it is infallible, it is the gospel, it is the good news. It is the truth of God revealed to man enshrined in His Word, the Word of God. And while this God reveals Himself to us time and time again, that He is a God of encounter, He is a God who desires for us to personally experience him our personal experiences are to be measured up to the word of God to see if they are the real deal if they are genuine to see if they are true or if they are of God to see if they are something that the spirit is producing in our lives or whether it is just something of the flesh but God's word doesn't just show us who he is it shows us who we are both as unredeemed sinners and also as repentant reconciled saints it is his word that reveals to us how we are to live and it it empowers us to do so psalm 119 uh, the psalmist asks and answer his own question how can a young man keep his way pure by taking heed according to your word As followers of Jesus, we are not just to walk blindly into our futures, fingers crossed, hoping that we just might luck perchance upon the path of life. No, his word is a lamp unto our path. His word is a light unto our feet. We can know our way forward. It is his word. Amen. 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 Well, I felt led to today and to to start a series of messages within a series on the topic of his body his bride his people starting in a message today called the gathering can you believe it it's called the gathering for those of you that are here maybe new wondering why we are called the gathering it's not because it's a cool name although it is a cool name i think um it's not for that very reason jesus said he would build his church that word church we're going to find out just a moment is the word ecclesia ecclesia means assembly or gathering church the word church means building jesus isn't building a building well he is but we're the building and so uh we want to do a series start a series this morning within a series entitled the gathering let's pray father god we thank you for your word that's living it's active it's sharper than any two-edged sword And I pray, Heavenly Father, this morning, as I speak in in, uh, generalities, I pray that you would speak to the specifics of every man and woman's heart here in this place today. We ask and invite you, Holy Spirit, to come again, not that you're not already here, but that we would be aware of that which you're doing, that which you're saying, that which you're wanting to redeem and restore in our hearts. We invite the redemptive, regenerative work of Holy Spirit into our hearts this morning. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would find good soil and produce a harvest in our lives that would produce much fruit in Jesus' name. And everybody said. Well, the life that we've been called to in God is not just one of vertical relationship. It's it's a horizontal one as well. Jesus said that the law and the prophets, uh, which was the word of God up until that point that had been revealed to men, Jesus said that the law and prophets really just comes down to just two things, love God and love others. We've not just been made for connection to God, but also for community. We've all been made for belonging and for acceptance and with an expectation on us now as Jesus followers to extend that belonging and that acceptance 
to our brothers and sisters in Christ. When we were saved and redeemed, not only do we now have and enjoy right standing with God, we've also been grafted in to the family of God, into community, into his body, his church, and more accurately translated, his gathering. And the gospel, the good news, has much to say about our life together as his gathering of Jesus' followers. And I'll read to you from Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 19 through to verse 22. Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 19. Consequently, these are good, you know, there's bad consequences. These are good consequences. Because of what Christ has done, consequently, you are now no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. We just sung about that. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Amen. You and I are no longer to be a, a floating individual. Just a, a random single body part floating around in the breeze. You are now part of the family of God. You are a part that makes up the whole. Or rather, we all should be a part that makes up the whole. Part of the whole that Jesus is joining together. Part of the whole that Jesus is building. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 4 and verse 5. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by human hands but chosen by God and precious to him you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus through Jesus Christ we are living stones that God is building his church, his body, his bride with, to be a part of the whole house. And this house is what Jesus is building as God's chosen method for reaching the world and equipping the church. And whilst it's far from perfect, it is God's plan. It is what Jesus is building and the enemy will not prevail against it. We win. We, the church, his body, his bride, our enemy, and we have an enemy, and he hates you. He hates God. He hates goodness. He hates your marriage. He hates your purity. He hates everything. He wants to see you fall on every corner and every arena and area of your life. But Jesus is building his body, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, what rock? Because Jesus just was earlier talking to Peter, and he said, well, to the disciples, and he said, who do men say that I am? And, and, and Peter says, you're the Christ. You're the anointed one. And this is where Jesus goes, yeah, yeah, you're right. Upon that rock, upon that revelation, Jesus is building his church upon the revelation that he is the Christ, that he is the savior. That, that's, that's the rock. Peter's not the rock. If you think Peter's the rock, we're all in trouble. He ain't no rock. Um, the revelation that Jesus is the Christ is the rock that Jesus is building his church or rather ecclesia. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And just like marriage is God's chosen method for family, the ecclesia is God's chosen method for reaching the world and equipping the saints. And just as there are no perfect ma uh, marriages, there are no perfect gatherings. 
However, while there are no perfect marriages, there are lots of marriages that are strong, healthy, godly, and are glorifying God. And the same is true with his gathering. While there are no perfect local gatherings, there are many that are strong, healthy, godly, and are glorifying God. So when it comes to his body, his bride, I, I want to caution you to be very careful about how you treat her, how you speak about her, and not to expose her flaws and her imperfections. Now, I'm not talking about heresy or immorality, in which sadly there is in the church. I'm not talking about those things. Those things need to be brought out and brought to the light and exposed. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about imperfection. You want to be careful about what you say because this is Jesus' wife that you're talking about. Now, I know that my beautiful wife, Kelly, is not perfect. Although, in my eyes... She's very close to it. Now, you need to tell her I said that because every time I say something bad, you tell her. So you need to tell her that I said that. She's very close to perfect in my eyes. But she's not perfect. She knows that. I know that. But start talking about her, picking on her flaws, pulling her down and look out. That's my wife. Don't you go pulling her down. Don't you go talking about her. I know she's got flaws, but she's my wife. Well, we are Jesus' wife. And he knows better than you what her flaws are. But you better just watch what you say about God's bride. Don't go pulling down what Jesus is trying to build. That's his girl. We are his body. We are his bride. God has purposed and called us to do life together in community as his house, as his gathering. And just as we can never be who God has called us to be without knowing him, without the regenerative work of Holy Spirit in our lives, we can never fully be who God has called us to be apart from this. Outside of this, outside of family, outside of community, outside of gathering together as the saints of God. This is what God uses to help us grow. This is what God uses to help challenge us and sharpen us. As, as iron sharpens iron, so one man's friend sharpens another. We need each other to sharpen each other. We need each other to be held accountable. We need each other to challenge and at times rebuke and correct. We need each other. We've been created for it. We looked at the account of creation briefly a few weeks back where God made and it was good. God made man and it was very good. And, and some of you made a nasty joke about when Eve came on the scene and that's where it all went pear-shaped. But before that, before God made everything and it was good and God made man and, and, and he was good, he was very good, and, um, and Eve coming on the scene, there, there was something that happened in the middle, something that God saw that he said is not good. Man alone. Everything that God did was good. And so I don't know if you can picture this with me, that there is no sin Man is perfect at this point. God is perfect at this point and forevermore. And man enjoys connection with God. And in that place of perfection, God sees something that's not good, that needs to be addressed. So you might think, you might say, me and God are sweet and I'm happy for you. But even in perfect Eden and paradise, God says that man alone with just connection to me, it's not good. Because God has not made us to live in isolation. He's made us for tribe. He's made us for community. And God, look, he's made us for family. And God looks and says, this is not good. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. Then the Lord said, it is not good. For the man to be alone, I will make a helper 
suitable for him. God says it's not good for us to be alone. Man not only needs God, he needs others. It's not good for man to do life isolated. You know, nothing good happens in isolation. Like as a, as a younger uh, youth pastor working with kids, it say, say, don't be alone with another girl. Don't be alone with a girl, with a guy. Don't, don't be alone. Nothing good happens in isolation. Everything bad that I did was, was, was under the cover of darkness with no one else around. Nothing good happens in isolation. Nothing good's when we're isolated even in our own minds as we begin to counsel ourselves and look to ourselves as a source of wisdom and go, no, this seems right to me. Nothing good happens in isolation. It's not good for man to be alone for so many reasons. For accountability, for encouragement, for protection. It's not good for man to be alone. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 1 says this, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. He rages against it. So this man, this woman, this person that removes themselves from the company of people, isolates themselves. I've got this. It says that it's almost like he looks at there's wise judgment. Ah, and he rages at it. So is a man who isolates himself. Now, it's necessary here to make an important distinction. There's a big difference, a massive difference between times of solitude and times of isolation. Jesus showed us firsthand the importance of getting away from the noise to connect with God, to be refreshed and refueled. Step away. Times of solitude to connect with Father God. But to take yourself out of the family of God, out of connection to the body, to the, to, to the bride in isolation is to rage against all judgment. It's not good to be disconnected in isolation from the gathering. Nothing good happens in isolation. It's all bad. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9 and 12 Shows us the blessing of community and the dangers of being alone. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity the one who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they'll, they'll keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. For those of us that have been a part of Christian weddings, we often hear that passage of Scripture, the cord of three is not easily broken. And that's true for marriages, most certainly, but it's true for us as brothers and sisters as well, that, you know, me and you and God, it's a three-strand cord that's not easily broken. There's protection, there's provision, there's encouragement, there's challenge, there's help. In community. Because here's the truth of it. You know, there, there, there's, there's some things, there's some of the goodness of God to us that's only ever seen and outworked from within family. In purpose, in provision, and in protection. We've all been made for connection to the family of God. The writer of, of Hebrews shares some incredible insight as to the reasons as to why this is so important to gather together in his name. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. And let us consider. I want to stop there. On that word consider. Let's consider the word consider. And let us consider. What does it mean to consider? What does it mean? It means to think on, to, to spend time dwelling on, to weigh up, to look at, to reflect upon. He says, and let us consider. So to take some time as to how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. 
not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. If that's your habit, change your habit. But encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So our coming together isn't for coming together sake. Well, I hope it's not for you. It's, it's not for me. It's not to tick a box, say we did Sunday service. Certainly not. It's because there are some things that God does in this space that only happens in this space. So the living word says that in making this, this gathering together a priority, making it a habit, it's so that it's for the reason of spurring one another on, spurring another one on towards, towards what? Towards love and good deeds. We don't gather together for service. We don't gather together for just worship. Because we can worship at home. Who knows? I've got a shock for some of you. I worshipped between last Sunday and this Sunday. And you weren't there. I read the word of God between last Sunday. This is a good thing for the pastor, isn't it? Confessions of a pastor. I read the word of God since last Sunday to this Sunday. I don't need you for that. But, but we need each other to spur one another on for love and good works. I need you when I start thinking something that's just not quite right. And you go, Michael, I don't know if you're thinking about that quite right. I need, I need a brother to sharpen another brother. I need someone when I fall down to help me up. I need someone to say, Michael, pull your head in when, when Michael, my head needs to be pulled in. We need one another. And it's not just because we are weak, although, burst the bubble, you're weak. God designed us for community. And just like in marriages, for those of us that are married, and we talk about this in a couple of weeks, that marriages can be challenging. Just an incredible place of blessing. It's the same as the community of God. It can be challenging at times. You've got to put up with me. I mean, geez, how hard's that? But what incredible blessing. There are things that God wants to do here that are only done here as we gather together. Blessing of community. To spur another one on towards love and good deeds and encouraging one another in increasing measure and in increasing regularity as we see the end drawing near. Now, I don't know when that day is, but I know that from yesterday to today, I am 100% sure we are a day closer. 100%. Not my, I'm 100% sure we're a day closer. So, that, so the end is drawing near. We, we, we get that right. So not less, but more. Not prioritizing other things over the habit of meeting together. No, increasingly prioritizing gathering together as the saints to be built up in our most holy faith. Gathering together is not a side note in God's plan. It's his chosen method for reaching the world and for equipping the saints. That's you and I. I know we like to think about saints from a Catholic perspective. Well, they are saints, but we're saints. We're the saints of God. If you're a believer, if you're a born-again believer, we're the saints of God. I mean, puts the pressure on us and kind of goes, geez, really? The bar's pretty low for saints these days. We are the saints. We gather together to be encouraged and equipped to be spurred on. And it's your job to spur me on. It's your job to encourage me towards love, not to frustrate me, not to pull me down to encourage me towards love and good works. It's the, the person to your left and, and the right. It's, it's their job. God, God has given you and them the responsibility to love, not only love on them, but encourage them towards love, to encourage them towards good deeds. 
It's his chosen method through biblical teaching, through encouragement, communion, community, correction, and the commanded blessing that's found in unity. Where the brethren dwell together in unity, there God. Where, where does he command it? Where? In unity. Don't have to ask to be blessed of God. Let's dwell together in unity. There he commands it. It must be so. He is commanded blessing. In the book of Acts, we get an incredible picture of the priority, the plan, and the purpose of his gathering. It's an incredibly high standard and a challenge for us all to live as his body, like what we see here as his bride, his church, the gathering of Jesus' followers. Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 42, going down to verse 47. They devoted themselves. Again, I just stopped there on that word or those couple of words. They devoted themselves. It was a free will offering in response to who God is and to what God was doing. No, no coercion, no, no manipulation, no guilting by the pastor, the priest, the apostle, the prophet. My prayer for us as a community of believers is that we would continually be and be becoming a people who in our own response to who Jesus is and what he has done and what he calls us to would of ourselves devote ourselves a life of devotion a life of coming and going a sometimes here, a sometimes there a life that's laid down, that's devoted they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Ah, for a devotion to prayer. Everyone was filled at, uh, with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their, their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. What an incredible picture. And what an incredible challenge for us to live up to. And I pray that we would all continually be on the journey of becoming more and more like that. What incredible generosity. I mean, we all squirm in our seats when we hear that they sold property to give to anyone that had need. It's like we all break eye contact with each other in that, in that moment, don't we? It's, it's a, little, a little bit orkies, isn't it? But there's a challenge. preferring one another, looking out for one another. All the believers were together. All the believers had everything in common. Every day they met in the temple courts and broke bread in their homes. So many things we fill our lives up with and we convince ourselves that they're of such great importance. It's so important that we do this. It's so important that we spend time there. It's so important that we spend money there. But on that day, I, I tell you, we're just going to look back and go, what a waste, what a waste of time. I mean, past the confession time right now, I just, uh, I, I, I don't know if I did say it the other week. If I did, please forgive me. I'm getting older. Um, but I just decided like all our, our, our streaming services and stuff like that, TV, just, just gone. I just got rid of it all. Um, not watching TV anymore, except for the football. Um, go the lines. And, but I was just sitting there and I was sitting, sitting on my phone as, as well as what actually, um, what actually triggered Holy Spirit used to trigger in me again. And look, I don't know how bad I am compared to you or others, and it doesn't really matter, but I was sitting on my phone and, you know, what, 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 a, what a sad 
What a sad physical movement it is, this. <laughs> and I just thought, this is what I'm doing? This, this is what I'm doing with my life or a portion of my life. And I, you know, and I wonder if I add up at the end of the year how many hours I sat watching just rubbish on TV or I, or I sat just scrolling through stuff. And it's like, yeah, yeah, but this is just my chill time, my downtime. I do other stuff that's of purpose and I love my family. And, and I do, and, and, I, and I do, and, and I'm sure that you do too. But, but, but yet, this, this is what I'm doing? And there's so many things. I mean, that's in, in a sense obvious, but yet it's not obvious to a lot of us, is it? But there's other things that we justify and we think this is important. And as I've been digging into to the value of the church, that, that what, it, what it is to Jesus and what it should be to us. I mean, the, the, the appalling epistles just goes to in just incredible detail as to how important this is. Of what priority this should take over, over most things. Of connecting together at believers. I mean to encourage one another to be who God has called us to be. I mean, really, what's more important than that? What could be more important with my time than, than, to, than to scroll through just a whole heap of crap? And that's what it is on Facebook, I, except for your photos, Ray, where I see you enjoying life and stuff like that. They're wonderful and I, and I enjoy that. You know, that's, no, but that's not, that's not rubbish, like seeing people enjoy life. That's pretty cool. But, but wasting the time doing it. What would be more important, scrolling through looking that or sitting down with, with Ethan and Lauren and, and chatting about how we can strengthen our marriages? Like spurring one another on to love and good works. Because, I mean, this is the gathering, but, but there can be other gatherings. Life group, so we gather together to go through pursuit. It's just ring up a mate, a friend. Doing it tough, would you pray for me? So much time and money spent on just stuff and things. May God realign us to look through the filter of eternity. See where we prioritize our time. Husbands, I'll give you a clue on priority. Your wife, your kids, wives, your husband, your kids, family, the family of God. So as we finish, would you stand with me today as we pray? As we go forward, let, let's, let's make sure. And once again, I, I've justified it too. I've said things about, about the church. And here's a funny, here's a weird thing with it. It is a two-way, you know, that you know what we're doing when we're picking down the church. It's like self-mutilation. You're the church, you buffed. <laughs> Don't pull it down. Build it up. To pull it down is only neg negatively going to impact on you. It's like self-harm, spiritual self-harm. Don't, don't pull down the church. Build her up. Like, I mean, the real church. As I said, I know there's immoral, uh, immorality and heresy, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the church. God's body, God's bride. Don't pull her down. Encourage her. Spur her on to love and good deeds building her up with Jesus and treating his bride with the respect and honor she deserves. Prioritizing in our time, in our regularity, in our deliberateness of our gathering together as saints to be equipped, spur one another on and in increasing measure as that day approaches. For this we've been made, to this we've been called. We are his body, we are his bride. His gathering, His chosen method for reaching the world and equipping the saints. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this time today in your gathering. And we've all been recipients of the blessing that is to be found in this place today as we encounter you in worship, encounter you around the communion table, encounter you in your living word right now. And as we're about to go out on the deck that that's not that's not a part b of it that that's that's part of part a that's part of the blessing of community family connection laughter tears prayer getting to know one another vulnerability putting ourselves out there that, that's part of the blessing of family and community so father god i just pray that we would see this as so much more 
than just something we do, something we attend. And as we look at a variety of different angles in the coming week, Lord God, that, that, that we would see this is that we're not just coming to consume, we're coming to contribute. That we are the body where every part does its part. And there is no lack when every part does its part. So, Father God, I just pray for, for every man, for every woman, for every child here in this place, that we would uphold in our hearts a love for your bride. Flawed, imperfect, but your bride, what you're using, your plan A for reaching the world and equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. So I pray, Lord God, that we, for those of us that need to, that maybe are in the habit of, of not gathering together, whether that be on a Sunday, whether that be outside of a Sunday, that we, that we gather here, we're faithful to do that, but we don't really connect with our brothers and sisters in any other way to, to spur one another on. Lord God, I pray that there would be a realignment of our priorities. That we maybe for some of us, like, like me on, on the couch the other week, where I just went, I'm not doing that. I'm just, I'm just not doing that. It's just a waste of time. Would you maybe awaken us, Lord God, to see that which you're doing, that which you're calling us into, that which you're calling us back to for some of us. So Heavenly Father, I thank you for your body, your bride, and I bless her today. That she may leave here empowered. She may leave here equipped. That she may leave here challenged. She may leave here encouraged. I bless her. And with every head bowed and eye closed, I don't know everybody in the room here today. And maybe you're not part of the body. Maybe you've never made a decision to pursue God, to receive that which is done for you as we went through communion and the price that he paid to reconcile you and you've never responded to that and you'd like to know more about Jesus and you'd like to respond to that and I'd love to meet you after the meeting and and pray with you but if you're if you're here this morning and that's you no one's looking around just raise your hand I just want to know who who I'll be praying with and I'd, I'd love to meet you after the service and just talk to you a little bit more about Jesus thank you so I encourage you to come down as we wrap up in just a moment and I'd love to pray with you. So we thank you, Father God, for your goodness and mercy. As we leave this place, Lord God, may we go empowered. Holy Spirit, move in our hearts and lives in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen, amen. Let's give God a hand of praise in this place this morning. Amen.